Byron's Games. You're watching Learn and Explore brought to you by Lava Proven Networks sponsored by Byron's Games. Today we have Erica from the Field Museum. She is a genetic scientist. Can you tell me about what you do here? Sure. So here at the Field Museum, we have millions and millions of things in our collections. So we have specimens of plants and animals. We have beautiful objects and materials that were created thousands of years ago. But it's my job here in the Pritzker lab to take the living organisms that we have in our collection and turn them into DNA sequences. Cool. So what is a genetic scientist? Well, my background is in biology. And what I do is I work with something called DNA. Do you know what DNA is? Yes, it's deoxyribonucleic acid. Deoxyribonucleic acid. So it's a lot easier just to say DNA. Uh -huh. But what DNA is, is it's the information of all life on Earth. So it's made up of four chemical letters called adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And we can read the arrangement of those four letters. We just abbreviate them to A, G, C, and T. And from that, we can figure out how things are related to each other. So you were talking to me about distracting strawberries. Yeah, we're going to extract DNA from strawberries. Okay. And there are several reasons why this is really cool. One, because strawberries smell good. Okay, yeah. Two, because strawberries are big um, and they're fruit and they're inexpensive. Uh -huh. And three, strawberries as a living organism they are what are called polyploidy. Poly. Polyploidy. Can you say that? Polyploidy. Yeah. So that means they have many, many copies of their DNA. Okay. So it means that when we do our strawberry DNA extraction, we're going to be able to see the DNA with our eyes. Okay, cool. Does that sound good? Uh-huh. So what we're going to do is a strawberry DNA extraction. Okay. So here are your gloves. My gloves, would they fit me? They might be a little bit big. They're supposed to be tight. So they might- Ouch. Be big on you. Okay, they kind of fit me. Kind of? Yeah. All right. And I'm gonna show you how a strawberry extraction is very similar to the extractions I do in the lab when I'm working with birds or fish or ants or plants or sharks. Cool. Byron, what I'm gonna have you do okay. is take one of these strawberries from the bag and put it in this new bag. Okay, wait, one of these? Just one. And the reason we use frozen strawberries and thaw them is because the freezing and thawing process- It's like I'm bleeding. Yeah, it could. But it helps break down some of the cellular walls and membranes of the fruits. So this is your specimen. Specimen. Okay. That's your specimen, it's a strawberry specimen. Here's my specimen. This is a piece of bird tissue okay. from the collections. And I've been asked to ID what species of bird this is. It's an unknown. What I've been doing is turning it into small pieces and starting to break down the cell walls and the, or the cellular membranes. Okay. You need to start doing that. So start squishing your strawberry. Squishing it like this? Break it down. Okay. Break up. So s strawberries being part of a plant, they have something called a cell wall. And so you're actually going to be physically breaking apart that cell wall. Okay. So the next thing you want to do is you want to add a buffer solution to your strawberry. I made this buffer solution out of shampoo and table salt. So these are ingredients that you can easily get at the store, right? Mm -hmm. So why don't you pour this into your bag? Okay. Can you hold it? Sure, yeah. All of it? All of it. Okay. Okay. It smells weird. It's shampoo. I think it's mango shampoo. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so now you can seal it up again and continue breaking down those cell walls and those cell membranes. Even more? Even more. And what these ingredients do is if you think about when you use shampoo or detergent, what are you doing? I don't know. You're cleaning things, right? You're getting rid of things, of debris. So yeah. you're washing the dishes, you're washing your hair. 
Um, and so that's what the shampoo is doing. Is it meant to be red? Yep. Okay, good. That's the strawberry. So the shampoo contains a chemical um, called SLS. SLS. And, and that, oh, I've heard of that before. Yeah, so a lot of women don't want that in their shampoo, but that's perfect for us because we do want it to break down membranes. And then the salt binds up all the other stuff that we don't want in the cell. So now what I want you to do is I want you to filter out your DNA. Okay. And so we're going to do that with any, yeah, any kind of glass is fine, um, a funnel. And then we just use coffee filters. They're cheap and inexpensive and Again. easy. And so what you're going to do is you're going to pour your strawberry stuff. Um, yeah. And so careful not to spill. And then we get to hit the fail button. <laughs> We're going to catch all the stuff that we don't want that's inside the cell. Okay. And we're going to filter out that um, the strawberry soup, basically, that contains the DNA. So we're going to see the DNA in there. Okay. So now we're going to mimic that by adding alcohol to your uh, DNA at the bottom of the speaker. So why don't you take out the the funnel and the filter, and you can just put on that baggie right there. So, do you I'll want to pour home. a little bit in here? I pour it? Wait, then what is this for? Oh, oh it's a spin. Yeah, so Stir. two hands. All of it? Um, no, let's just pour up to here, up to the 50 mil mark, and let's see what happens. Oh, you can keep going, keep going. There we go. Oh boy, we got a good one. Okay. And so what happens is DNA is insoluble in alcohol. It doesn't like it, so it seizes up and starts to come out of the solution. Cool. Do you see any differences in texture or color? It's kind of bubbly and it's not as red. Why don't you take your stir stick and see if you can- So let's stir yep, it around. In there and, and see what's happened. Just stir it around. Now, why don't you lift up the stick? What is that? Whoa, is that DNA? That's DNA. Cool. Yeah. Here's some DNA. So Byron, I have an activity for you. Okay. Um, I want you again to do something that I do on a daily basis in my job. Okay. So I want you to figure out a relationship between bird species. Okay. Can you do that for me? Yes. So my question is, which bird is the closest relative of the flamingo? Okay. So what's, un what's cool and unique and unusual about the flamingo? It, um, it's pinkish reddish. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. And it doesn't look like a bird. It can't fly. Can it fly? It can fly. Oh, it can fly? Oh, okay. So a flamingo is a type of bird. It is. Oh, cool. I didn't know. So here, so let's now, let's take a look. This is called um, a gala. A gala? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then we're going to look at this bird. That's a weird looking one. This is called a tinamou. A tinamou? Yeah. Are these all close relatives to the flamingo? Well, I don't know. You're going to figure that out for me. Okay. And then this bird is a duck. It's called a grebe. A grebe. It looks like a duck. It does. Oh, that one looks similar to the flamingo. This is a spoonbill. A spoonbill. Cool. And that one's a robin. Close. No? A, a cardinal. 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 Okay. So you have these five birds. What are you going to look at to figure out which is the closest relative to the flamingo? The DNA sequences. Right. But can you tell from just these these pictures, which bird will be the closest relative? Uh, maybe this one. The spoonbill? Spoonbill, yeah. Why do you think that? Because they both are tall and have long necks and um, they just, and they look similar. They have longer legs than the other ones. Okay. So let's see. Those are good observations. So 
We're gonna flip them over now, and these are DNA sequences from each of the birds. Okay. So I want you to take a look at the DNA sequences of each of these birds and tell me which one is most similar to the flamingo. So here's the spoonbill. This is the one that you thought. Yeah, that's the one that I thought. What do you see here? C, T, O, G, G, C, G, C, 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 G. So what? they're kind of they're kind of similar. Um, a, a, a little, little bit. bit. Like a some of them bit. are the same. So let's take same. a look. So that's the spoonbill. Let's put it aside. Which one should we look at next? Um, I'm looking at them, and now I think that this one. Okay, hold that one up. That's the grebe. Okay, the grebe. Okay, now let's do this one. C, C, G, 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 C, C, A, 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 G, G, C, T, 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 C, C, G, G. That one's really similar. That's really similar. Yeah, that begins with a T. And then the spoonbill begins with the T. So it looks like what's the closest relative of the flamingo? Then this one, the this grab. Reeb. Yeah. So that's something where we wouldn't have known that if we that were correct? just. That's correct. Oh, okay, cool. We wouldn't have known that just by looking at the physical traits. They don't look similar. Though. They don't, but but they are closely related. And then what we can do with all these DNA sequences okay. is we can plot them and turn them into a tree of life. Cool. Is that a tree of life? It is a tree of life. So this is the tree of life for birds. Only for birds? For birds. Oh yeah, because they're all... Yeah, so can you find... Let's see, there's the tinamou that we saw. Um, oh, wait, so would, would the flamingo and the... What's it called? The uh, grebe. The grebe and the flamingo would be on the same yeah. part of the tree? Yeah, so over here. Oh, the flamingo and the grebe are yeah, right that's here. right. And then something else that was really interesting when we did this work was that everybody thought that falcons were really closely related to hawks and eagles, right? They're all birds of prey, they've got yeah, long they talons. All, yeah, they all, yeah. Well, do you see falcons on here? Falcons are up there. Right. But they're on the same, they're both on the orange part, but they're not on the same right. branch. Right. But they're actually more closely related to parrots and to songbirds than they are to hawks and eagles. That's weird. Yeah, so DNA can tell you things that's not visible to, to your eye or to your observations, right? Uh -huh. So um, we can use DNA for birds to build family trees the same way that you know, human doctors and geneticists can use DNA to figure out our, our family trees. Cool. So this is what you do in the lab all day? It is. I get to work with all kinds of organisms. Plants one day, ants the next. What project are you working on now? So one of the projects I'm working on is we're looking at a mouse that was collected from an island in the Philippines. Cool. And we want to see if it's a new species. And so I'm looking at several regions of the DNA or genes that I can use to identify this mouse as being similar or different or completely the same as other ones. And so what I found so far is that it looks to be a new species. Wait, so it's like a one of its kind? Mm -hmm. Cool. So it's different from all the other species that are living um, on these mountain ranges in the Philippines. Cool. And so it would have its own branch on a mouse tree of life. A mouse one? Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Who's your favorite scientist? Um, well, when I first knew I was interested in science, um, I was most inspired by Jane Goodall. Oh, she does the, uh, who again? Chimpanzees. She's a primatologist. She was somebody that I really looked up to and I was lucky enough to hear her speak when I was in high school. Cool. So she really inspired me. And the other person of science who inspired me um, was a man named, his name was James Harriet. He wrote as James Harriet, um, but he was a veterinarian. And okay. he did big animal. What's a veterinarian? Well, it's an animal doctor, basically. Okay. And I loved the type of work that he was doing. And so I had envisioned myself um, studying the genetics of big animals one day. Okay. That's when I was in high school. What was the tough time you had to go through? Um, I've had projects that just uh, have not been easy. 
And so in that case, I look to my peers. I ask a lot of questions, but I find that getting through those tough times is when you really have to open up and admit that you're having a difficult time and look to others for help and support and advice. What advice would you have for a kid that wants to study science? Keep your curiosity alive. So be somebody who likes to ask questions. Um, look for opportunities to do science. So okay. if it's from a, a kit that you order online or just going outside and exploring, um, always be asking questions. And when you get old enough, ask science teachers or grown-ups for help on how to pursue science. Thank you, Erica. You're welcome, Byron. Thanks for watching. You can find out more at fieldmuseum.org or if you come to the museum, you can come talk to me Monday through Friday at 11 to 12 p.m. Bye. If you've been watching my show from the hospital, I hope you get better. Keep your chin up. We can take off our gloves now if you want. <laughs>